from a defabricated solar power garden shed in Rockland County, New York, USA. This is Stand Up with Pete Dominic. On today's episode, how to solidify your best retirement plan by getting in on the hot new Texas real estate market. And now, the podcast host who can't wait to tell you all about his local hot market, Pete Dominic. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. My local hot market is a toaster oven in my kitchen. Thank you, Pete Co. Good to be back. Took Sunday night and Monday off, meaning no pod for Monday or Tuesday. But today I am back with a hell of a guest, one of your all-time favorites. The great Tim Wise joins me today. We have an amazing conversation that I always love talking with Tim. He's always an amazing guest. And thank you for giving me a couple days off. I highly recommend you turn off your screens for 24, 48 hours or more. If you can, I mean, put on an email, out of office alert on your phone. Just put it all away if you can and try to get refreshed. I did my best. Some things worked. Some things didn't. It was less than 48 hours, a little more than 24, but I'll take it and I will do it again. And I highly recommend it. So what did I miss? I mean, Monday, Tuesday alone, crazy busy news days, but... Yesterday is giant news. A jury unanimously found Donald Trump, former disgraced former president, liable for sexual abuse, battery and defamation of E. Jean Carroll, awarding her five million dollars in damage. A judge, another judge, barred Trump from publicly posting evidence and other material related to the pending criminal hush money case. The Senate Judiciary Committee asked Republican mega donor Harlan Crow to provide an accounting of free travel and gifts he gave to Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. President Biden met with Kevin McCarthy, the House Speaker, and other congressional leaders for the first time since February to discuss the raising of the debt ceiling. And between 34 and 38 percent of Americans say they have a great deal or a fair amount of confidence in Joe Biden, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, and Congress to do the right thing for the economy. On tomorrow's show, I'll talk to Barry Ritholtz about that last detail. Also, Federal prosecutors filed criminal charges against George Santos. And tonight, Donald Trump is going to be doing a town hall on CNN. CNN, who is raising eyebrows for branding Tucker Carlson a right-wing extremist and then hosting Donald Trump. So plenty to discuss and talk about in the news, but no time to do it tonight. And I'll tell you why at tomorrow night's hangout. The last week and my life has been, well, challenging And many of you will be able to relate with my challenges. I look forward to sharing them, but I just have to figure out how best to do that here on the show and at tomorrow night's subscriber hangout. So sign up now and welcome to any new subscribers. I got to give shout outs. Haven't done that in a while. And if you're not sign up now, I'd love to have you, obviously, because this is what I do for uh, for a living. So sign up now. Go to standupwithpete.com so you can support the podcast if you haven't already. All right. Let me get to Tim Wise. We'll get more into new stuff tomorrow. And as always, I'd love to hear from you on what we should be talking about. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com. So many listeners always send me great ideas, suggestions for sound, for guests, for topics to discuss. And I highly appreciate it. Highly appreciate it. Greatly appreciate it. I'm very grateful to you. All right. You all know and love Tim Wise, don't you? He is an anti-racist speaker and author and activist. Spent the last 25 years speaking to audiences in all 50 states, over 1,500 colleges, high school campuses, tons of academic conferences, community groups across the country. He's trained corporate government, entertainment, media, law enforcement, military, and so much more. The author of nine books, most recently Dispatches from the Race War. You can support him on Patreon and subscribe to his essays at medium he's great on twitter timwise.org for more information always good day when we get to talk to the righteous brilliant and always super passionate anti-racist tim wise let's do it all right i've got him now on the phone we can't see each other and i like to see you and i hope this that we connect is good but you sound amazing tim wise thank you for joining thank you Thank you very much. I definitely have a, a face made for radio and a decent voice for radio. So this this is better for me. I, this allows your audience that doesn't know what I look like to think that I look far, far better than I do. So this is great. <laughs> uh, you look like Steve Buscemi. That's like an ugly actor. <laughs> I have was... Steve Buscemi's eyes. I will say that. <laughs> I, I, yeah. 
I will take you, however, whatever uh, connected device we can get you on. We're always really happy to have you on the show and in conversation. There's a lot that I want to ask you about today. First of all, how how do white people fight? I want to ask you about you know, fighting honorably or dishonorably, you know, jumping right. someone, I guess, uh, hitting them when they're not looking, fighting dirty. Is that a is right. that a racial thing? Well, I, 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 I'm going to answer it, but I, I'm going to assume your audience knows the, the context for this. But let me just, you know, just for clar- clarification for anyone who doesn't, obviously, this is in reference to Tucker Carlson, famous, famous MMA fighter, Tucker Carlson. <laughs> uh, yeah, you wrote a great <laughs> piece about this for more. Con- Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> and he, wa- he wants us all to know how white men fight, because, you know, you, you know that, that Tucker Carlson has a long, long history of fisticuffs. You can tell by looking at him. And he made this comment in a <laughs> in a text message, right, which is what is so fascinating. And, and it's, it's really important for us to talk about, because here's a guy who's made plenty of racist comments on the air about immigrants, about, you know, the great replacement of 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 presumably what he's talking about, white people with brown skin, people from the global south, et cetera, who he says make the country dirtier. We're used to that. From from Tucker, but in a private text message where he doesn't expect it to be seen, it really reveals some interesting things. And so his comment about this video that he watched um, in the days after, I guess, January 6th, where there were three or more uh, MAGA white guys, as he put it, who were, you know, kicking the crap out of or beating the crap out of an Antifa kid. And he talks about how he sympathized with the mob. He he wanted them to be the kid. He, He wanted them to kill this child or this young man or whatever it was. And, um, and of course the bloodlust alone is, is disturbing, but the thing that was really telling, right. Was the part where he said, but well, you know, it is dishonorable because this is not the way white men fight. That was his critique of it. Not that this is awful terroristic mob violence. Oh my God. How could people on my side of the political aisle do this? My God, how could they misunderstand what we're about? No, it wasn't that he wasn't horrified by that. He was horrified by the dishonorable nature of it all, the, the the violation of the presumed purity of arms that white men, according to Tucker Carlson, have always fought with. And what I think is so telling about it, <clears throat> I mean, there are two things, right? Number one is how ahistorical it is, mm-hmm. because indeed mm-hmm. the whole history of how white men fight since we became known as white men is exactly this. It is exactly ganging up on innocent people, taking advantage of numbers and attacking them. That's certainly the way white men fought when we took the land from indigenous people. It's how white men fought when we enslaved African people. It's how white men fought when we, you know, lynched black folks from trees and burned their bodies with blow torches and cut off pieces of their bodies for souvenirs, which was a thing that people don't always realize happened, but it, it was a thing. They used to take pictures of lynchings and trade them like baseball cards as postcards in this country. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the kind of thing white folks did when, when, <laughs> When the two guys that killed Emmett Till did what they did, they were fighting very much like white men. When Bull Connor did what he did in Birmingham, he was a white guy doing white guy things like white men have done exactly this. So it's obviously a historical and it's worth pointing that out in a moment where people like Tucker Carlson are trying to whitewash pun very much intended the history of the country. Right. Not to let us know that that's actually how white men have fought, not actually wanting to let us see that that's the history. So that's number one. The second thing. That's fascinating about it is how incredibly white supremacist it is. Some people might say, oh, you know, it's not as bad as some of the stuff he said on air. No, it's actually worse because the stuff that he said on air is like your typical boilerplate anti-immigrant feed the base red meat, get them all ginned up. You know, you expect that and you expect somebody like Tucker Carlson to, you know, do the great replacement theory bullshit. And 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 that's we're, we're used to that. But what's worse about this is that it implies that there is an inherent betterness, an inherent virtue to whiteness. Um, Not just something, you know, it's not just Tucker saying, hey, I like I like Western culture and I'm afraid non-Western people coming to it will change the culture. I mean, I think that's racist, but you can make an argument that he and he would that that's not about race. You know, he'd say it's about politics. I just don't want these people coming voting for Democrats. You can make that argument, even though I don't believe it. That's an argument you can make as an out. But what is your out when you're saying that white men fight virtuously, that that we always fight honestly? And here's the here's the kicker. When I heard the comment, 
it immediately took me back to something that I remembered from my days uh, in the work against David Duke. As most of your listeners or many of them know, that's that's the first thing I did out of college. The way that I sort of got my start in, in anti-racism work was in the campaigns against David Duke, lifelong white supremacist, former Klan leader in Louisiana when he ran for office in right. 90 and 91. Yeah. And <clears throat> there was a comment that I remember Duke making from an interview that I had had to one of my jobs was to listen to all these old, awful interviews that he had given <laughs> to various researchers. I got to sit and listen to David Duke got to. bleat on about, you know, Aryan supremacy for hours on end. It was a horrible, horrible job. But um, I remembered something and I went and I dug out this old media resource packet that we had put together for the media in, in, in those campaigns with all of Duke's like greatest hits of awful racist nonsense. And I found this, this quote and it's a little different in the sense that he was comparing white people with Jews, whom, of course, he thinks are not white. He considers Jews an Asiatic subrace, as all Nazis do. But the point is that the comparison that he's making sounds very similar to what Tucker is saying, basically comparing whites. And I presume he's talking about black people, it seems to me, or other people of color. Here, here's the quote from David Duke. This is from a March 1985 oh, great. interview. I'm going to read it. So the, the quote says, you know, our people in Europe were open people. They were very honest people. The whole chivalric medieval type of morality is a good example of white morality compared to a Jewish type of morality and openness and honesty. You're not necessarily nice, you know, but if a white person stole something, he'd just steal it. He wouldn't sneak up behind you, play a trick on you. If he wants your wallet, he's just going to take it, you know, but a lot of Jews wouldn't even do that. You just don't cheat somebody. It's not the Christian thing to do. Jews operate by different rules than we operate by. Now, think about that. That is an incredibly parallel kind of comment, and that is coming from this country's most prominent white supremacist and neo-Nazi in the last half century. And what he is saying is there's this inherent essence of whiteness and white Christianity, he is also suggesting, that basically says, even if we do something we shouldn't do, we do it with honor. You know, we, even if we beat you up or steal your shit, we're going to, we're going to just be honorable about it. You know, it's going to all be like, 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 like Burr and Hamilton having a duel. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not going to be, it's not going to be a sneak attack. We're just going to steal your shit. We're just going to beat your ass because we're white men, you know, and when, when Tucker Carlson, the, the top rated, you know, cable host and, and, for some people, they talk about him as a possible presidential candidate someday uh, to, to parallel in his words. The, the thinking of David Duke tells you just how far into the mess we have descended as a country. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the reasons we've descended into that mess is because of right wing media. And I want to talk with you about the, the shooting in Texas, of course, and yeah. how that guy was influenced. But first, before, because I haven't talked to you since Tucker Carlson was fired as as far as I can remember last time we no, talked. No, we have not. Yeah, yeah. So, so what do you think is the impact of him not being on the air? My perception really quickly, and I've been telling people this and maybe you disagree, is it's a huge triumph because of his specific type of rhetoric was leading other commentators and giving them permission. Fox News, 8 o'clock, this kind of racist, horrible, sexist garbage uh, yeah. was animating actual people to be violent all the time. It was creating all kinds of horrible ideology that others were picking up on following. I feel like every day he's not on TV is saving lives. I'd go that far. What do you yeah, think? I, th I think that that's very possibly true. I mean, it's certainly a victory and I would never want to want to downplay it. It's important for him to be on the air less rather than more. I mean, I would celebrate when he would go on brief vacations, you know, that, that was great. Yeah, like right. Even, Good point. Even, Good just point. take his family, you know, take your family to universal, please do well, something. It's like, yeah, it's like when Trump wasn't talking or tweeting or <clears throat> Tucker's on vacation, it would, it seems like the temperature comes down like a, a, just a tiny bit of a degree, maybe. Right. Absolutely. And so, so I think we want to accept that, that partial victory. And I, I say partial because it's like, you know, it's like, uh, uh, you know, a, a double header where you win the first game, but you know, there's another game coming, you know, or it's like when you're in a three game series and you get the lead, but don't forget, you know, you still got to win the series. Right. And, and my concern is that, um, obviously he's going to land somewhere. There's no way that Tucker Carlson is going to be going anywhere. He's going to try to 
get out of his non-compete clause, which, uh, you know, those can sometimes be hard to enforce. My guess is he's got an attorney that's good enough to get him out of that. Um, and he'll probably land somewhere. Now, what we do know, of course, is that despite their best efforts, Newsmax and all these other right wing news outlets just have not had the success that Fox has had. They just don't have the, the formula that Fox has. So he won't do as well there. He'd probably do far better to go the Joe Rogan route or something like that and try to do a podcast or, or, or something along those lines. So he's going to land somewhere. So we, we, we can't, we can't prematurely celebrate as if the war is over. This is a battle. He, he's off the air for a minute. That matters. While he is off the air, it is important for us to, to gather our, our strategy and our thinking about how to respond when he does land, how to preempt wherever he lands, how to counter what he is going to do. And my concern, to be honest with you, is that once he, you know, figures this out and, and tries to get out of his non-compete, I, I am not beyond worrying about, and I've said it on social media, the possibility of him running for office. He is probably the only person in this country mm. with the level of both celebrity and the ability to articulate this horrific pseudo populist right wing MAGA vision of Donald Trump better than Trump himself. And he's one of the only people who could actually compete with Donald Trump in a primary, whether it's this year or maybe running later on in a few years. And, and anyone who thinks that Tucker Carlson, just because of all these negative things, couldn't win the Republican nomination or even the presidency just isn't paying attention to the country they live in right now. You know, yeah, he's got all these horrific things he said. Well, you know, so did Donald Trump and it didn't matter. So I, I worry about his ability to tap into that same vein that Trump has tapped into. I don't know if he has any interest in that, but I know he certainly has a big enough ego that I wouldn't put it past him. So let's not let's not count the chickens, as they say, but let's certainly celebrate the temporary reprieve that we have from having to listen to his droning every night for sure. I will go on the record now, right now and say he will never run for any office. I hope you're right. I'm always, I really hope you're I'm right. almost always wrong. <laughs> Which means, which means if you're almost always wrong, he should probably start measuring drapes for the Oval Office. Yeah. Great. Yes, <laughs> for sure. No, I mean, I just can't. He's he's a Tucker Carlson is an extremely intelligent operator. Yeah. And he's made some pretty dumb mistakes, I think, in some of the text messages and stuff and things that he said yeah, sure. privately. For sure. That was oh, yeah. that was dumb. I won't give him any credit for that because it. But I. I this guy is a survivor of media. All of the networks just keeps yeah. going. He's very good at what he does. And I yeah. think that he will continue to want to do that for all of the, the incentives that he, he has. He loses yeah. a lot of that, I think, running for any office. But and, yeah. and who have we seen be really successful in media, for better or for worse, and then jump into a political run? We see the opposite all the time. So, right. And, and the re so so that's what I'm basing any comfort on uh, on Tucker not running on, because if you're doing really well in media, it's almost True. a step back to. True. To I mean, run. in a way, you know, right. In a way, I mean, Trump, Trump, even though he was successful as a game show host, that, that, that show wasn't as successful for Trump as Tucker Carlson's empire is for Tucker from a financial or professional perspective. So, so uh, for yeah. Trump. Yeah, for Trump, running for office actually was a step up, even as much as his family would say, oh, it was a sacrifice. No, dude, you had a shitty game show that nobody was watching anymore. You yeah, know? no, that's and, a really good point. Really good point. Yeah. Uh, OK, so let's talk about uh, what happened in New York City uh, on yeah. the subway. Uh, there was a black man who, of course, everybody's heard about this. I don't think I really need to describe it, but he was yeah. ranting and raving. I see it almost every day that I'm on the subway. And sure. uh, it can be scary for sure when someone because you're you're not sure maybe they're going to lash out, especially when they're angry and and sure. yelling about things. In this case, the guy was yelling, he didn't have food or, or, or water. I'm sure most people probably had compassion for that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But a, a, a well-trained Marine and clearly an MMA guy, maybe not, uh, yeah. who was white, of course, choked him out and murdered him. And he's dead. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know how at play racial the racial issue was with this i don't know yeah. I, i'm not yeah. sure that that was the issue someone was ranting and raving um and somebody else uh, <clears throat> killed him is is how i kind of see it do you think that right. race was you know is, is worth talking about in this in this case well there's always something symbolically about race when you have a white man with or without racist intentionality 
putting a black man in a chokehold and ending his life. I mean, I mean, given the history of the country and even the history of New York, I mean, this is a city where, you know, Daniel Pantaleo killed Eric Garner with a chokehold over in Staten Island not that long ago. There, There is a history that that we can't that ignore was just so far worse because it was a police officer i would oh of course of but, course 100%, i mean maybe 100%. not this guy was a marine he should have known well but, i mean i mean it was it was what made it i mean obviously dead is dead and awful is awful but yeah. what made it more clearly uh, problematic even in the eyes of most of the public i'm sure is that eric garner literally was doing nothing he was not ranting and raving he was not demonstrating any threat to anyone yeah. even in no way yeah. could you perceive him as a threat whereas we are deathly afraid of mental illness in this country and maybe that's a universal thing like we don't understand it and so it scares us and i get that and and having been around folks that are in the midst of a psychotic break of some kind i certainly know that that is a scary thing um so i'm not going to i'm not going to suggest that this this marine had racist intentionality he went back to his training which unfortunately is to quote unquote, neutralize threats. And when you've been trained to neutralize threats, you've also been trained to see threats, you know, sort of everywhere. And and so he That's goes to really that. That's a really good point. Would you elaborate on that when you're trained? Yeah, I just well, I think, you know, look, when you're when you're I'm, obviously I've never been a Marine, but I certainly know people who have been. I know people who have served. And and, you know, one of the things you have to learn in order to be an effective soldier is you have to you have to be willing to kill. And the truth is, most people are not. Most people are not born with sort of the instinct to kill unless, uh, you know, unless you're being immediately threatened. You there is a thing that keeps most people from being willing to pull that trigger, even in a battle. And they have to desensitize you to that. They have to you have to change your psychology to be an effective soldier. And anyone who's done sort of psychological research on 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 soldiers knows that you, you've got to train a person to kill. And in order to do that, you train them to see threats. Hopefully you train them to discern real from. from 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 not real threats, but mm. in a in a in a world where soldiers are being sent back, and I don't know this guy's history, precise history, but I know that you know most folks who have been serving in the last twenty years have done multiple tours of duty. They have seen multiple tours of combat, and they have been raised in a in a in a in a military environment where this sort of a siege mentality. It's this never ending war on terror. Everything is scary. Every you know, if you see something, say something. Every, you know, sort of everyone's on high alert and have been for a very long time. And if you're a soldier, even with decent intentions and no overt bigotry, when you see something in a closed, confined space like a subway, there's a really good chance that you're going to overreact and you're going to think, I've got to neutralize this threat. And you're going to use a chokehold, which a which the cops at least have been told not to use. Now, sometimes they still do it, but the cops have been at least told, hey, you're not supposed to do this. Hey, this particular hold is illegal where well, there is no illegal when you're in war, really, except for the Geneva Conventions. There's no rule that says you can't use a chokehold on on somebody because usually you're not going to even get that close. You're going to shoot them or you're going to, you know, whatever. So this guy goes to his sort of priming and his training. And would he have done the same uh, if the person who was screaming and yelling had been white? Yeah, probably so. But we can't dismiss the, the the possibility that this touched into stereotypes about mentally ill people, for sure, stereotypes about poor people, regardless of race, which and, and, and lower income folks, which is also an issue. You know, if this person had been wearing a suit coming from Wall Street after having a bad day on the markets, yelling and screaming, he probably wouldn't have choked him out. So there's a class <laughs> element. Right. Yeah. Um, and, <laughs> he wouldn't be on and, the subway. <laughs> no, well, he wouldn't he be would on the never subway. Lower and, himself. But no, I right, exactly, take your point. Take exactly. Your point. And, okay. and there and there's a racial element too, just just based on the history. So we don't have to say, oh, this guy's a horrible racist person for having done this. What we can say is that we have to do something about the way that we view people who are in the throes of mental illness. And all we do in this country is continue to say every time there's a mass shooting, every time something like this happens, oh, we got to deal with mental illness. We need to deal with mental illness. And then no one ever really has a plan for dealing with mental illness, at least not on the right. You and I have talked about that before. Talk about, oh, well, we just need to deal with the mental illness problem. Governor Abbott said that in Texas, you know, after this latest shooting, uh, which which apparently was motivated by racial hatred and was motivated by bigotry. But instead of talking about that and instead of talking about guns, he just wants to stigmatize the mental illness element, even as he doesn't want to put money into mental illness and emotional well-being treatment and and, and health care. Uh, so we we talk a lot about mental illness, but at the end of the day, all we do is run from the mentally ill and not try to actually deal with that problem. Well, talking, doing something about mental illness, almost anything, almost anything costs money. Yeah. 
for me, for my mental health, the one of the best things, there's several things I can do on my own. Not a good example. I shouldn't have chosen an individual, but uh, you know, therapy costs money. Other things yeah. I do don't cost any money. I meditate, I exercise, I read, I write in a journal, I talk with friends. But, but I mean, when we're talking about systemic mental illness, if that's what we're talking about, it, it, right. you need resources, people, right. uh, facilities, education. Right. There's, there's so much. So it's just so tiresome. If you want to do something about mental illness, the next question should be about, you know, what do you want to do and how much do you think it's going to cost and where's that money going to come from? Fair? Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would say of all the of all the health care issues that we face as a country and we face a lot of them. And, you know, for those of us on the left, we do tend to support whatever we call universal health care, you know, single payer. Many of us support, obviously, which is a comprehensive thing covering all types of health. But I would say that as much as 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 the kind of health issues we think about are important, you know, cancer, heart disease, all the things that we know literally take lives every year. And we need to be covering those things and we need to be putting money into that research. But but we need to put at least as much into mental and emotional health. We are living in a, a particularly unwell time mentally and emotionally. And there are lots of periods like this throughout human history where, you know, the pace of social change, the pace of technological changes is is faster than our ability as humans to adapt to it. And so some people, you know, it, it literally breaks your brain sometimes to be in such a chaotic time in American in, in world history, not just American history. And for people who are struggling in, in that kind of world, for people who are suffering and don't have the resources to access the things that they need, um, those kinds of mental and emotional health issues get worse and worse and worse. So we should be spending huge amounts of, of, of money on mental and emotional well-being, at least as much as we're as we put into some of the other things that we that we spend money on. And unfortunately, I think we still have an attitude that stigmatizes the mentally ill and essentially says you're weak, right? There's a, if you're, if you're sad, if you're yeah. depressed, if you're anxious or, or, or if you are, you know, bipolar or if you have schizophrenia or whatever, there's something, there's something wrong with you. You need to get your shit together. You need to, you know, or maybe you just need to go be locked away somewhere. We don't want to see you. We don't want to deal with you. We don't want to try to help you. We don't really understand it. We think that you're, scary and dangerous. And ironically, because, you know, obviously if you think someone is scary and dangerous and you don't help them get treatment, they're going to become scarier and they're going to become more well, dangerous. So it's not very logical to respond the way we do, but that's what we do. We just want to put people away out of sight, out of mind. And I think it's because deep down what we're all worried about when we see someone on the subway who's screaming and yelling or, or, or who's acting aggressive in some way or what we perceive as aggressive because it may not, not be aggressive, but we perceive it that way. It's because deep down, we're afraid that if that person could snap and have mental illness and emotional illness and go down that spiral, well, how do we know we couldn't, right? You don't yeah. know what causes someone to have a break. And that's scary. You at least figure, all right, maybe if I don't smoke, I won't get lung cancer, right? Maybe if I, maybe if I exercise, I, I, you know, I won't have heart disease, but, but mental illness can hit anyone and you and you don't know. And so it scares us. And when we are scared of something, we try to just sort of ignore it to our detriment. The vast majority of folks who deal with uh, any kind of severe mental illness are far more likely to be victims of violence or hurt themselves than hurt others. That being sure. said, if you want to if you want to keep people safe from the very few who are violent to others, then you would want to support resources and uh, facilities. That will right. accommodate them and that will either treat or cure them or keep them safe uh, from themselves or to others. But people don't want to pay for that. You can. Right. It, it's one way or the other. You, you can't right. say we want to do something and then do nothing and then not have a little bit of skin in, in the game. And right. we have a lot of conversations about and we'll continue to the, the resources that are available here. Uh, but obviously it leads to violence. What's different here is guns. And so right. let me ask you about that. Uh, is being a Nazi a mental illness? No, I think it's a characterological defect. <laughs> it's a it's a it's a character flaw. Um, well, isn't I don't it think a learned a, ideology? Yeah, it is. It is. But but I think if you if you learn the ideology and then you adopt it, as some have at a very deep abiding level, it becomes, you know, sort of embedded in, in who you are. And so it becomes a character flaw, but it's not it. it and it says something about your character that you can so easily be 
um, a sort of entranced by something like uh, Nazism, the extreme of that. Uh, but I think, yeah, it, it doesn't mean you're mentally ill. And I don't think we should think of it that way. I think that, of course, you know, ideological zeal or zealotry and, and hatred can function the same way that mental and emotional illness can function in the sense that if you have mental and emotional illness, sometimes you don't see things clearly. You're not going to be able to always properly assess what someone is saying to you or, or listen to someone else's opinion about something because you're in the throes of your illness. Well, the same is true when you're in the throes of your ideology. If you're really deep into Nazism, for instance, you're not going to rationally, you know, sort of weigh the evidence about whether or not the Jews really do run everything and whether or not, you know, the, this group or that group is out to get you. So it can, it can mirror the way that mental or emotional illness uh, operates, but it's not itself a mental or emotional illness. It is a, it is a thing that you, that you choose to manifest after having been propagandized for a long time. And so at the individual level, you have both more culpability, uh, but also at the systemic level, we as a society have culpability because this ideology is taught uh, both directly and indirectly, white supremacy is taught. And at the extremes, it can very easily flow into something like neo-Nazism, where a person comes across this material, perhaps online, in a way that's much easier than what would have happened 30 or 40 years ago. And as a result of this sort of incessant uh, stream of poison, they become convinced that this is the way the world is, and this is how one should view the world. And uh, it has an effect on your brain, which I guess if we were to, you know, hook someone up, I, I don't know if this has ever been done. If you were to hook someone up to a to an MRI or some kind of brain scan imaging thing where where you could see like what parts of the brain were lighting up when people were were, uh, let's say, on 4chan and looking at, you know, horribly racist content being posted by incel edgelords in the basement of their parents home. You know, maybe you would see the same part of the brain lighting up as the part that lights up when you do drugs. I don't know. I mean, maybe. Right. But. But uh, even if so, I'm not going to have quite the same sympathy for someone in the throes of, of uh, let's say, a drug addiction as I would for, you know, in the throes of a Hitler addiction, because I think the, 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 the pathway from point A to point B is a little bit different, a little bit more troubling um, in the case of the of the Hitler fanboy. So um, <laughs> well, so I wouldn't me, put them in the same category, but they but they have similar effects when we talk about violence or specifically gun violence. We always need yep. to probably have nuanced conversations and understand uh, that there are different kinds of violence, gun violence. Uh, obviously, a huge percentage of it is people taking their own life. And we can talk about how they got there and how they got a right. gun and how it's a, a, a really a, a, a very final way to do it. Uh, then yep. we can talk about domestic violence, uh, crimes of passion. We can talk about gang violence, uh, which often has a, to do with like business and and. Yeah. Uh, drug uh, uh, commerce and so on. Uh, when we talk about these mass shootings, which we tend to talk about because they're so spectacular and horrific and they make us fear our lives when we're going to a mall, a church, a school, uh, yeah. we, we, we can talk about what th was the impetus for that. If a kid was picked on, if a kid yeah. had issues at home, it, it can be a whole bunch of things. But wherever these shootings occur, if the person is animated by an ideology like Nazism or something similar, yeah. white supremacy, we yeah. we shouldn't call that mental illness. I think we should right. call that terrorism. Right. right. And we do when it is Al Qaeda. Immediately right. we do. If it's a brown Arab guy, which it almost never happens in America, by the way, right. or it certainly right. isn't like because of their ideology these days. And it's right. almost always when it's ideologically driven, one of these right wing white supremacists, it's documented over and over. How do we talk about uh, this guy in Texas who had swastikas and yeah. was and, and by the way, I certainly want to ask you, can a Hispanic person be a white supremacist? Can a black person be a white supremacist? I mean, we've talked oh, about this before and people don't seem to understand that this shooter whose name I won't say, apparently he's Latino, uh, yeah. had a swastika on his body. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he had a swastika. He had SS tattoos. He he uh, from what I saw, he had posted himself, you know, in like a German war uniform. I mean, he was an out and out Hitler fan and 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 had been articulating overt Nazism. In fact, there was one meme, I think, that he was sending around that was very telling. It had a it's like a cartoon and um, and it had a fork in the road. And at the bottom of the fork, it said, you know, Latino, I think Latino children, I think it said. 
or Hispanic children. And then at the fork in the road, one fork went over here to like, you know, become a white supremacist. And the other fork went the other direction and said, you know, act like act like black people or something or or whatever. And he was basically saying Latinos have to make a choice. Are we going to act like black people or are we going to become white supremacists? So it's not at all shocking that you're going to have people who are technically in this country viewed as persons of color who are going to adopt white supremacist thinking. Number one, look, white supremacist thinking is is the is the is the underlying ideology, part of the underlying ideology of America. So it's taught to everyone. And obviously, if you're a person of color, you're more likely to resist it. You've got some sort of, you know, sort of social and cultural antibodies against it, but you're still being affected by it. It doesn't go away. We know from the from the research on implicit and subconscious bias that large percentages of people of color end up having bias against their own group. So it's not shocking. Now, most of that's not at the level of like Nazism. But we can't be surprised that occasionally that will happen. And let's let's also be very clear that for a lot of Latino folks in the United States, there has been a pretty consistent effort over the years made by some to whiten them, right, to 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 view them, to to dismiss or downplay the indigenous part of their heritage and background. Because keep in mind, most Latinos that you're going to meet in the United States are are have have indigenous heritage, indigenous to the Americas, as well as European heritage. But there has been a constant effort. To uh, going back to the conquistadors to play up the European element, right? The Castilian element, the Spanish element, as opposed to the indigenous element. We've seen in, in, in countries in Central America, right? I, I was, uh, when I was in college, most people don't know this about me, but before I really focused a lot on race, my, I was primarily interested in Latin American politics and my minor was Latin American studies. My huh. concentration in poli sci was international relations in Latin America. And one of the things we saw in the eighties, in, in countries like Guatemala, the, the dictators in Guatemala had a real nasty habit of launching vicious military attacks specifically against indigenous communities in the mountains of Guatemala. And, and these were these were sort of, you know, quote unquote, whitened military dictators. Not only were they lighter skinned, but they identified more with that aspect of, of their heritage. And they would go after the, the, the indigenous of their communities for being inferior. They treated them as racial others in many instances. So so this problem of white supremacy is absolutely not one that only affects, um, quote unquote, white people. It also affects people who, for whatever reason, like this guy, identify with whiteness. And the other thing about this guy, he was wearing a patch that said right wing death squad over right. and over. Like so often we get into these arguments and I'm fine with it. But like, what is the root of uh, the political ideology of, of this violent person? And yeah. every once in a while, it's a progressive. It's very rare. But even then, it's hard kind of to connect them to their politics other than the yeah. one that was. I think the most overt about it was the guy who shot Republicans at the at the baseball game. He seemed to be pretty overt. But yeah, this over and over and over, they are saying, I am a right wing conservative. And the issues that animate them are racist or sexist or anti gay yeah. or a mix of 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 many. And right. we don't really need to we don't need to discuss it. I mean, I can't imagine it being any more blatant that this guy said this is what I believe, and this is why I'm killing people. Often they write manifestos, right. and then we still dismiss it to mental illness. And I think that's a really important point to differentiate or hair to split. It's not a hair. It's a very yeah. important thing to differentiate between someone who is ideologically driven by right. their, in this case, right-wing ideology, and so often it's that, or Al-Qaeda, right. their religious ideology, in this case, they're Christian right. nationalists often, Versus someone who's mentally ill. And that, so I'm just right. underscoring my earlier point about right wing death squad guy. Yeah. Yeah. There's a very conscious effort on his part to tell us what he believes. I mean, it's not it's not a jumble. You know, there there have been people who have committed um, acts that it was hard to to discern, like the guy that shot Gabby Giffords. Right. Um, and 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 the judge, uh, I think it was also in Arizona. Jared Laudner, I think, was his name. And, and he clearly had suffered lots of mental illness. Now, there was some evidence that came out that he also was like like to listen to Glenn Beck. And he had certain views that were maybe politically conspiratorially on the right. But it wasn't clear. Like in his case, you could say eh, it's sort of a jumble. It's it's not real easy to figure that out. And, he, and that probably was true mental illness and, and schizophrenia that had driven him to his actions. But in this case, this guy 
is consciously deciding to put on an RWDS right wing death squad patch. He's got the swastika tattoo, the SS lightning bolt tattoo. Like I don't have any tattoos, but they take a minute, you know, like it's not like he got in the middle of the swastika and was like, Oh shit, wait, what am I doing? This is a swastika stop. Like, no, you paid for that. You had an artist who did that for you and, and you conscious. And then he's got photos. If I, I believe it's the same guy. I saw this on Twitter. Somebody tracked down like his wedding photos or something. And he got married in a like in a Hitler like costume what? with a fake, fake little Hitler mustache and, and his bride, his bride next to him dressed like Ava Braun and she's a Latina and they're in the back. Oh, yeah. You haven't seen this. And no. this, is, this is this was this was I, on Twitter yesterday that this was on his his social media. He was on some Russian social media server. Um, he didn't have much of a social media profile like on Twitter or anything like that, but he was on some Russian site and he had posted all of his rantings and ramblings on there. Didn't have much interaction. In fact, it looked as though maybe it was more of a personal diary than anything else. But some of the stuff that was posted on that site, uh, I'll send you the link uh, to, to this that I, that I found. I, I mean, like, I'll look into that. But he also, you know, openly said that his hero was uh, Joseph Men- Mengele, the famous yeah, Nazi. Mengele, right, 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 right. Exactly. I mean, this is a guy who, if these pictures are, are, are genuine, and it seemed like they were, because this guy that dug it up all fa- found all this stuff on the on the server and was able to match the the, the information to him, uh, then this is a guy who, for a long time, has been really enamored of not just racism in like a general boilerplate way, but overt neo Nazism and white supremacy. Um, and so, whether it's him, whether it's Peyton Gendron in in Buffalo, uh, the the killer there. You know, over and over, the, the shooter Patrick Crucius in El Paso, uh, Dylan Roof in, in Charleston, um, you know, all these folks, one after the other with overtly right wing politics. And, 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 and yet we do in that situation tend to either say, well, we say it's the mental illness, but then if you have someone who is like the, the shooter here at the Covenant School in Nashville, who doesn't appear to have had any ideology. This is a shooter whose who's only social media profiles were pictures of art that they had done, and there's no political art, there's no ideological art, but just because the shooter was apparently trans, people on the right are saying, oh, it, they must have been targeting the church because it's Christians. Why don't, we, why don't we talk about anti-Christian hate? Well, there's nothing to suggest that that was the motivation here. And although they haven't released the so-called manifesto, the people that have talked about it have seen it, the, the cops have said, look, it's it's the, the reason they haven't released it. It's a jumble of nonsense. It's not going to tell you anything. It's not it, it doesn't have any coherent narrative. So that may literally be a great example of mental illness. Right. Having been at the root of what was going on there. But but when it's you know, when, when the right sees an opportunity to say, oh, it's about trans rage, it's about anti-Christian hatred. But then when it's one of theirs, which it almost always is. Right. When it's someone who is who is in line with their thinking, then it's like, oh, we just got to pray and and we got to we got to do something about the mental illness. And then you ask them, well, what is that thing that you want to do about the mental illness? And then they're like, I don't know. Conversion therapy. I mean, which brings brings me to the point where we don't we have no idea of this. As far as I know, you know a lot more about that. Of course, it was very close to where you live. uh, And that school is a Christian school. A lot of people are saying, how come we're not complaining about that? We are. Of course we are. No one should be targeted for the religion or what they believe. But and I'm not saying in any way that this is like a, a, a Chris Rock, like, but I understand why OJ killed. I'm not saying I yeah. understand it. But if you're constantly targeting gay people, constantly targeting black right. people and one of them reacts violently, you can the, the, the solution might be stop targeting them stop telling them they can't be who they are but no matter what regardless we should all agree and do something about the guns that these people can get their hands on so whether it's christians or muslims or gay or white or black if we could agree that access to firearms is what separates us from the rest of the world then we could make a dent in the violence right well either you have to you have to believe one of two things is true either the united states is filled with the most awful, horrible, violent, and mentally disturbed people on the planet, or we have a gun problem. And and mm-hmm. if you want to accept the former because you don't want to admit the latter, then what you're saying is, man, this is a really horrible, lousy place filled with really messed up people. 
And we're not number one anymore, for sure. You don't want to go on the USA, USA, because now you're cheering for an incredibly inherently violent, awful place filled with emotionally disturbed and, and, and dangerous people. I don't believe that. I don't believe there's any reason to think that the United States is filled with people that are worse than people anywhere else in the world or more disturbed than anywhere else in the world in some organic, you know, mental way. Um, but clearly, we have the ability to blend what is a natural human issue of mental and emotional disturbance with an incredible amount of firepower that most other countries simply do not have. And if we're not prepared to face that and the ideology of otherness and othering, which is not inherent to us as it, well, it, it is inherent to us. It's not unique to us. Um, we got to deal with that too, because if you take the access to guns, the normal human condition of mental illness and you overlay on top of that a nation whose ideology is rooted in the sense of domination and subordination, of domination of the so-called other, the racial, the cultural, the ethnic, the religious other, a, col a colonizer kind of state, which is what the United States has been at the ideological level since the beginning. That's a, that's a very toxic combination, especially as that country begins to change, right, as people see the country changing demographically and culturally, and you've been taught and led to believe that the, the, the way that America always was was this great thing and therefore needs to be made great again, right? That ideology, in addition to the firepower, in addition to issues of mental illness, all creates a situation that's incredibly, incredibly dangerous for all of us moving forward. Before I let you go, I just want to ask you one more question about what's happening uh, in my community. So I live just north of New York City. I don't know if you heard about the story, but uh, the mayor of New York, Eric Adams, is is sending some of the uh, migrants who have been sent to him on buses mm -hmm. by uh, Texas, I guess, and other states. Yeah. This this whole uh, gimmick, which is creating so much chaos uh, yeah. everywhere. Uh, yeah. So he is now so he gets them in New York City and now he wants to send 300 of them to live in a hotel it, where I live in Rockland yeah. County. It's creating yeah. a firestorm here in my town. Now oh, all the expenses would be paid for by New York city taxpayers, I guess right. uh, the housing right. shell, the, the food and, and anything else they need. I'm not sure for how long, but the right. firestorm it's created here in my town and our, yeah. uh, the, the leader of our County went up and said some, I think racist things, but certainly really, really uh, terrible things. And everybody here is supporting him. At least the most vocal people are. Um, yeah. You know, th this is the kind of scary thing that also happens. I mean, because these people are mostly they're they're mad that they're that these people are getting any kind of care. All right. Right. We can talk about that. They say they get better care than veterans, which is preposterous. But, Tim, the main yeah. issue is that they think. So many people think these people are going to come into our town and to be violent and nothing could be further from the truth uh, statistically. Of course, they're not nearly right. as violent as we are to each other. And furthermore, right. they travel all the way across the the, the planet the, from Central America, maybe to commit yeah. crimes in America. They are yeah. here yeah. most working. And finally, my final point is just a pithy one. So many of these people in my town, including my neighbor, uh, complaining on Facebook and then hiring these people to mow their lawn. Of course. Of course, of course. They're here course. to work, and they do work. They're here for opportunity, and they take that opportunity. What do you... What, you well, know? And let's be clear. They didn't want to be there. They were sent there as part of a political gimmick as props for the governor of Texas, or in the case of DeSantis sending a plane full you know, to Martha's Vineyard. That was all for the, for the comms, for the, for the photo op, for the ability to say, look how tough I am on immigrants these folks were were in texas trying to either if they were trying to get asylum or they were trying to get legal status or whatever it was they had no intention of coming to rockland county to do anything not to work not to steal not to do anything they didn't want to go to new york they were sent away as part of a political gimmick so what the community needs to be doing is reaching out to the folks and, and acknowledging that they have been victims they have been the victims of a con and and and, and creating a sense of connectivity to them they didn't come there to do any harm. They didn't come to the United States to do any harm. As you said, most of the people, look, the, the, the people who would most like 
to be able to stay. I mean, most like for, for Mexicans, for instance, to be able to stay in Mexico are Mexicans themselves. Nobody just picks up all their shit and goes to another country for shits and giggles for fun because they got nothing better to do on a Wednesday. Right. Like if I'm going to go to the trouble of packing up and crossing a desert or doing whatever it is that I have to do to get into the country, uh, whether it's whether it's with documentation or without, I'm obviously desperate. I don't you know, those of us who have moved, they always joke about how moving is like the the most stressful thing next to divorce. I think I've told you this before, but literally, you know, 10 years ago, my wife and I moved three blocks, three blocks, not a different country, not a different state, not even the other side of town three blocks and it damn near killed me. And I told my wife, I'm like, I'm never doing this again. I don't ever, they're going to take me out of this house. I don't want to ever move again. I do, it's that stressful. Is it, so now imagine, you're forcing us to guess why you would uh, go three blocks, move three blocks. And I'm sure it was because the previous house was haunted. Could be the only thing. <laughs> no, it, it, was, it wasn't haunted. Was it we ghosts? Just need- <laughs> and did you, uh, t- were you transparent about the buyer, to the buyer? Because apparently you legally have to tell people yes, that if, there are go- that you think there's. <laughs> I'm sorry, there was no a- ghosts. There were there were there were Nazis coming to the house and like leaving hate messages for me. So oh, the uh, poor people case, who bought the house. Pro- in which case, I probably and I didn't. We didn't tell the people. I probably should have told the people. Hey, by the way, if if somebody comes to your door and burns a cross, like yeah, that's me. Sorry, I didn't do it, but it was because <laughs> of me. Um, the but, point uh, was moving is stressful. Why would you move? It is awful. Yep. Why would you? Nobody wants to. Nobody want our and James Baldwin said this about white folks, too, you know, that we forgot that that our people didn't want to come here either. You know, Europeans didn't want to have to leave Europe if they'd been doing well in Europe. They wouldn't have left. That's why the king did not leave. That's why the royal family didn't like just say, oh, well, fuck it. We're just going to get on a boat and and go and go to the, the colonies like. No, they wanted to stay. If you were doing well where you were, you would have had no reason to, 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 to leave. And so if you're struggling and you're desperate, you make a move. That's what our people did, quote unquote. That's what all people do. Migration is, 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 an, is, is evidence of cultural dislocation and failure. When people feel they have no choice, they go. And then if you then fail to greet them and you fail to make it possible for them to make a living or get an education or obtain health care, then yes, yeah, some among that group are going to commit crime in order to survive, as would anyone, as did many of those European immigrants in cities like New York, if they weren't able to survive. You know what? They stole. That's I mean, this is this is a human thing. But instead of treating people as human, we have been encouraged to treat them as less than human. And instead of saying instead of recognizing that the villain here is the governor of Texas who sent these folks to New York as a as a piece of political theater, as opposed to the mayor of New York sending them out to Rockland or as or or uh, the result of 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 the immigrants themselves. The, The villain is not the immigrant. The villain in this case isn't even the mayor of New York City. The villain. Is, is all the way back at the beginning of that line, which is the governor of Texas trying to score political points by sending them to a, quote unquote, big liberal city in the north. Well, and the villain now yeah. is a guy named Ed Day in my county. He's the county executive who is demonizing these people. Yeah, of course. I mean, the, who is softer than a person that can't understand uh, someone who traveled through the horrible, horrible conditions to get here. Right. It, a very right. soft person who's never really had a lot of adversity in their life that can't understand why someone would leave their home, go to another right. place where they don't speak the language and don't have a job through horrible right. conditions, likely uh, knowing that they're going to be considered the way that my neighbors are considering them. But those those are the, the softest of people, in my opinion. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. They, and, and every objection that they raise is an indication of just how truly privileged and, yes. and, and supported yes. they've been because you cannot imagine um, what it takes. And, and, and we act like we can because we think about, you know, oh, when my great great grandfather came with 13 cents and a ball of lint in his pocket, <laughs> it was so, you know, it was it was so noble. And well, OK, maybe it was noble. Maybe it was desperation. But you know what? The same 13 cents and a ball of lint is in the pocket of every one of those folks that you're demonizing. You know, yeah. And, and the and other maybe- thing that you hear so often, so often is why don't they come the right way, the legal way, the way that I did or my relatives did. And it's I, I'm minimizing the, the whole immigration issue. But the reason is because the ladder was there and the door was open for them right. and they closed it in 2013. Congress tried to pass comprehensive immigration that had all the goodies for security that Republicans wanted. And in the Republican Senate, 
They passed in the in a, in a Senate. They passed it. It went to the House. It was never voted on. That's right. John Boehner wouldn't take it up for a vote because they thought it would pass. If it had passed, there would be so many more solutions and security, but pathways, doors open, ladders not drawn up. That's the difference. They, well, they can't come be, here the way you be, did. And let's and let's be honest. Like if the door had been closed to European immigration. In the early in the early 1900s, for instance, uh, the way it was to Asian immigration, for instance, since the 1880s and and, and uh, really immigration anywhere other than Europe, if the door had been closed and and those European countries had been right next door to the U.S. where you didn't have to cross the ocean, let's say you just you, know, you had to go across the border. Do you really think that your great great whatever wouldn't have crossed the border? Do you actually think like right. if it had been. If, if it had been easy enough to just sort of try to get over the border that my great grandfather wouldn't have done it, what would he have done? He, he'd have been like, let's say, you know, my, my great grandfather came from, from Minsk. So, okay. So if Minsk, if Belarus, modern day Belarus at that time, Russia had been right next door, like where Mexico is, do you think my great grandfather would have said, well, you know, we're starving here in the shtetl, but, uh, <laughs> you know, screw it. I think we'll just stay here and die. Even though I could cross that border and maybe my kids would have a better life. No, he would cross the border. Everyone would cross the border if they could in that situation. So the fact that your people came quote unquote legally is simply a reflection of the fact that the law didn't prevent them from coming. That's all that is. If the law had prevented them, many, if not most of them still would have come because survival is more important than the law of this country that you're looking at where you where you might actually have opportunity. Let's not let's not be precious and think that somehow our our families, we would have just stayed and starved. Right. We would have just stayed. Right. And been, it's ridiculous. You know, and it's the, as you said, it's humanity. It's the human experience. You look one way, you look another way and you go the way where you think there's less danger and more security. If you can. Absolutely. If you can. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. All right, Tim. Awesome as always. Thank you very much for letting me call you and pressing record. You are the best, and uh, I can't wait to talk to you again because I always learn so much from your perspective and expertise. Thank you, and sir. I'm so sorry that your that your audience didn't get to see me this time. I know that's. A I'm going to put some there. audio clips up with the best still <laughs> image of you from years ago. <laughs> Great. Oh from yes, years please do ago. that. <laughs> All right, bud. Thank you very much. All right, man. Take care. All right, there he goes. There he goes. Tim Wise. Check him out, everybody. TimWise.org right now. Go subscribe to all of what he is doing. And I look forward to talking to you tomorrow. That's all I've got today. You know, I have been ending with a with a quote. And here's a quote I don't like. Uh, it's something like this. Uh, this is your Monday morning reminder that you can handle whatever this week throws at you. Nope, I can't. I didn't this past week. <laughs> I mean, sometimes it's too much. I think that's important. I think it's important to say sometimes it's too much for us to handle. It doesn't mean you don't go forward and put your one foot in front of the other. Keep on counting your breaths and keep on trying. But sometimes it is a lot more than you can handle. So I prefer this quote from Nito Poibin, who said, Your present circumstances don't determine where you can go. They merely determine where you start a little bit better than you can handle whatever this week throws at you. Right? Okay. Well, I can always handle whatever John Carroll throws at me because we love him. JohnCarroll.org. Go buy this song. Go support him. Thank you, Pete Coe. And thank you, everybody, for listening. My bumblebee friends, I'm buzzing around with you. Love you. Talk to you tomorrow. For your fence, even if it ain't a very friendly audience, look, they'll begin to listen when you start making sense and you stand up. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws. And since they weren't even sin, they knew that.
change was gonna come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know it's his time to go and make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up All right, we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be told up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no ones and try Rise up Show obedience to the voice inside And listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide It says stand up 